Good evening and welcome to Education Number One Priority. I'm Dr. Mary Jane Garza. Well, as you know, May 30th, the 84th legislative session is over. 140 days of fast power thinking and a lot of things occurred under that dome in Texas, in Austin, Texas. But the South Texas area came out a winner in many aspects. How do I know that? I've been reading and researching. But more important than that, as always, at the end of the legislative session, I invite our representative, our calendar committee chair for the legislature, Representative Todd Hunter. And he's here with us this evening, and he's going to be sort of recapping what's occurred at the 84th legislative session. Welcome to Well, Education. thank you so much. It's good to see you. Oh, it's great to see you. You know, as I was reading all this, I had a lot of fun just going in and looking at everything that has transpired <coughs> from January the 13th till the end. A lot was accomplished. That's right, it was a lot. A lot. Now, you've been in the legislature now how many years? Been here, I've been in the legislature eight terms, that's 16 years. 16 years. And calendar committee chair? I've been that for six years. For six years. A lot of things happen. Absolutely. Now, one Absolutely. of the major things that occurred this past time was a change of leadership. We had the change of leadership in the governor's office and in the lieutenant governor's office. What was different about this session? You know, this session, we started the session and a lot of people were questioning how everybody would be and would they go this direction and that. What really ended up happening is you had a governor, a speaker of the house, and a lieutenant governor who ended up working together and getting the goals of Texas accomplished. And the real reason that you can tell that happened, there's no special session. It's the first time, what is it, in six years, no special session. So that shows you the work was completed, the work was done, and the three leaders did work together. In every legislative session, you have hills and valleys. Mm -hmm. And you have good arguments, that's what Texas is known for. But in the end, the grade card is, did you get your work done, which we did and particularly for South Texas, for the coastal bend, we did extremely well. Well, you noticed that in my intro because as I was researching, I, the more I looked at it, the more I thought South Texas really fared very well. Very well, well. Okay. very, very well. Yeah, and let's talk about those issues because sure. I know all of them are important, but first of all, and in the newspaper. That's right, that's let's, right. Let's talk about that headline, windstorm, because that was, that was major. Big time. We have been working on this for 12 years. 12 years. We've actually worked on it longer, but 12 consistent years. And we finally accomplished the bill. We finally accomplished the goal. And here's what's great. The Texas Senate passed it. The Texas House passed it almost with 100 votes. Close to 100 out of 150 people voted for it and the governor signed and filed the bill. So we accomplished all three goals. I think it may be the first time the coastal community, especially the coastal bend, came forward with a windstorm bill, went this far and passed it. Great teamwork and it shows when South Texas and the coastal communities get together, they get things done. Well, let's talk about it because sure. I think our, our listening audience wants to know what exactly does this mean for for us who live in this Absolutely. area? Absolutely. First of all, for everybody that's uh, watching, everybody has to get insurance on their homes or their buildings. And what you generally have to do if you live in Texas is you get you like your house or your building insurance. In coastal communities, there's a history that you get insurance for the building wind insurance, and flood insurance. Right. So what's unusual is we have to pay three policies versus everybody else's one. And if you go into West Texas, North Texas, Central Texas, the cost of insurance is extremely low compared to what the coastal communities are paying. So what we've been doing over the last 12 years is trying to, number one, educate coastal communities shouldn't be paying these exorbitant rates. So let's look at Corpus Christi. We haven't had a wind hurricane since 
1970. What's that, 45 years ago? Yet Amarillo and North Texas have had gigantic storms. Exactly. And we haven't had that. Yet I don't see that area of the state getting uh, the same sort of treatment that we do. So, what does this windstorm bill do? Number one, it corrects the biggest problem, which is the board makeup. The board makeup has always been five to four, six to three against the coast. So when I get people that say, hey, why did my rates go up? It's always because this windstorm association would vote against the coastline. Now, it is made up of three inland, three coastal, and three what I call kind of hybrid. Mm -hmm. This time, the taxpayer and the ratepayer and the people making the decisions and paying the bills finally get a say so the very first time. You also have a funding structure, so if a hurricane hits, you got a sound funding structure where the finance now of the association is strong enough to pay these bills and to withstand these sort of storms. In the final, we're going to see some increase of competition. I was at a meeting this morning where somebody's saying already they're seeing some of the private insurers coming back to the coastal bend selling. So for those watching, you're now going to get to have some say-so and see different people to buy insurance from. And then it'll take two, two and a half years, but you will start seeing, in my prediction, a rate reduction, which is what I know everybody wants. And some people say, why does it take two, two and a half years? It's because most of your insurance policies are year policies right. or two-year policies. But you look at that two to two and a half years, we're going to be in a situation for the coastal community having selection of insurance companies and some reduced rates. Great. Well, I want to thank you personally because I know this has been dear to your heart for Absolutely. the longest time. Absolutely, and it's good to accomplish, but I go, it's kind of uh, working together, get things done, and we did it. Well, another, I think, gold star for us is that 2% state hotel occupancy yes. tax. So we need to, some people may not know about it. And to me, when I looked at that, I got very excited about that. So Absolutely. let's visit about that. Sure. What happened in this legislature is a lot of communities in the state, so that the listening audience understands, is that your communities collect your taxes. And they go and they get hotel, motel right. taxes, and they accumulate it. Well, what a lot of people don't know is that some communities in the state can use the collection for certain projects. And what we did was get Port Aransas and Corpus Christi the ability to use this for beach cleaning and beach cleanup. Why is that significant? You no longer have to go out and say, we've got to raise your taxes to pay for this. We now use it in just the money that's collected. So. You'll see beach cleanup from Corpus Christi to Port Aransas. You'll see a lessening on the burden of the taxpayers here. And you know what? It promotes tourism and travel. I was going to say, and we'll see beautiful beaches. Yes. Because people keep saying, why do our beaches not look like? That's and we'll right. name certain states. And people don't realize it just doesn't happen. Absolutely. And what happens a lot of times is we have visitors from all over the state or the United States and they come down here and you got to remember we still got to clean them up. So now we're going to be able to accomplish that. Uh, another win-win. But let's talk about some other sp uh, specifics. Example, the aquarium. Absolutely. I have been a big, big proponent of the Texas Aquarium. And uh, I know they're in the process right now of expanding, right. which is what we need to do. It's a great tourist travel attraction. It's bringing people in across the world. And in the appropriations budget, we were able to bring several million dollars to the aquarium. And in addition to that, Texas A&M Corpus Christi gets a boost, especially in their engineering program, which helps them expand further. And University of Texas Marine Science Institute Port Aransas. A lot of folks sometimes forget that we have an A&M campus. We've got a UTMSI, right. University of Texas campus, and we've got Del Mar. All will be excelling under this budget. Texas A&M Kingsville? Texas A&M Kingsville and Texas A&M Corpus Christi both did well. They got tuition revenue bond uh, packages this time where they are now able to raise money for some building expansion. It was just a good, good session 
for South Texas and the coastal belt. And I mention that because sometimes we wonder what, what's occurring there and to have all of this occur. But let's not leave South Texas just yet because there's a study that's underway. Absolutely. Uh, that's been approved. And I know people keep saying, so when are those cruise ships going to come? But it takes time and it takes studying. So tell us about what the legislature did here as well. Well, like you told me as I was just before the program started that uh, what's called the 8CR, that is a House Concurrent Resolution. I'm the author and what it does is it pushes forward for the state to help bring cruise ships into the South Texas market. And it is drafted to focus from Cameron County, Brownsville, to the Coastal Bend area, to Port Lavaca, Cal uh, Calhoun County. That whole zone will be over the next year and a half being researched, being hearings, being looked at to bring in the cruise industry. And I've had some contacts. I've had some people saying, hey, it would be a good place for the Coastal Bend, the Corpus Christi, Port Aransas area. Why not look at cruise ships to maybe Veracruz, Mexico, or Cuba, or Panama Canal, which is opening up. So we're in a prime location, but what's great is the bill you talked about, which a lot of people don't know, uh, is going to go into effect, which allows us to set up the foundation for bringing the cruise ship industry here. Yeah. Well, I, when I this morning when I was checking the calendar and I noticed all the things that had been approved and the governor had signed off on it, I thought I need to ask that because that is a big win as well. It's a huge win and it hadn't been talked about a whole bunch, so you're one of the first ones that we've talked about, but it's a big economic factor for us. Well, again, I'm, I'm really impressed with what's happened on this legislative set, specifically the effects it, it is bringing to South Texas. I mean, it's phenomenal. It truly is. What's happened, and a lot of people say, well, what happened this time? Well, there's two things. One, Texas has done well economically. Mm -hmm. We have money. That doesn't mean you spend all of it, but it means you have it to do the things you need to do. The other thing is the coastal bend, the Corpus Christi, Port Aransas area, is now positioned with some senior legislators. And what's happened where other areas of the state don't have the experience, now we have the experience. We had been the reverse in other times. But today we're in a situation where we do have the experience, we do have the seniority, and it does help get things done. So very positive for Coastal Bend. And it does help that you are the calendar chair. Whatever helps, I'll be glad to try to help. Now, you know, one of the topics that's dear to my heart is education. Yes. Let's talk about that. And I know people will say, well, there's never enough money. And I'll be one of the first to say there never is. But there was some, some dollars yes. invested. So let's talk about what our uh, pre-K through 12th grade public schools can expect. Well, the governor in the beginning of the session announced that he, one of his priorities was the pre-K, the pre-kindergarten program. So right off the bat, we have a governor who is for education, for the pre-K program. The House of Representatives was very, very supportive of the governor. And the Senate, who came in second, just because that's the way the process is, became supportive of the program. So all three groups came forward to send a positive, we're here to help education. And so what you'll start seeing here, and I can't remember when it goes into effect, if it's September or January, but what you'll start seeing is some new programming, some new funding, basically to develop the pre-kindergarten. A lot of people say, why pre-K? It's because the earlier we get a hold of this, yes. the quicker people learn, yes. the more opportunities, the more innovation. And let's just face it, today we're in such a technological technology these kids know that. And so the younger you can get them plugged in, the more Texas blossoms. So it's a very, very big positive. Well, another positive that I noticed is that the legislator accounted dollars for the expected growth. 
That's correct. And that had not been done before. That is exactly right. What everybody should know is you look at formulas, but now that Texas is growing in a certain way, they wanted to make sure that money is allocated based on the growth. And it's pretty good because you have a focused uh, formula on how to oh, do yeah, it. Oh, yeah, I know, because they're expecting about 93,000 students, and Absolutely. they funded it. And that's a first, and I don't think people are aware how significant that is. That is correct. Well, another thing I noticed was math academies. Okay, that tends to be an area where, number one, uh, statewide, we've not blossomed as we should have. And I think they uh, what, about $22.8 million for math academies? There's a pretty good uh, amount allocated, and so everybody knows, you know, uh, worldwide, you, you've been seeing most of, again, the technology and the way things progressing on mathematical formulas. And so now we're going into math academies and we're going into that area. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, all it's going to do is give a good foundation for Texas to excel. Well, it also provides school districts the opportunity. Absolutely. To, uh, they also did, I think, $17 million for reading academies. Right. And that's crucial. Because when those reading academies were funded, we did see a significant rise in reading. Absolutely. And one thing I want us to look in the future, all our kids now, and I'm sure any parents watching, knows that everybody's on video games, they're on their iPhone, their iPad, everybody is plugged in technologically, and that's a language. Mm -hmm. And right now it's no longer communication with just you and me, right. it's worldwide, statewide, United States wide. And what a lot of folks don't realize is that our school districts are no longer just two language schools. We now have multilingual. I was in a school district recently where they told me they had 15 dialects. Oh, yes. One thing I'd like to see Texas is to really boost language learning. What better marketing than to be multilingual? It's not only great marketing, it's great job economics. And if Texas could take the lead on becoming multilingual, Arabic, Asian, Spanish, French, whatever, you're marketing, you are excelling, you're also curving yourself into an education arena that could make us excel much quicker than a lot of the states. It's interesting you say that because if we look at the coastal bend area, we begin to see yes. that internationally we have companies coming in and they're having to bring their people, and by that I mean because we don't know the language. That's and so right. they have to rely on people that, number one, understand their culture, understand the language, and the way the company works as well. Absolutely. I was on uh, coming over here looking at Facebook, and I saw some friends of mine whose kids are going over to Japan. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very smart. They're going over there to learn the language, and they become marketable, and you get a great job. You got a great job early. Well, let's now talk about the top five legislative wins. Okay, first of all, the budget. All right, uh, we have a two hundred nine billion dollar spending plan for the next two years. Right. Absolutely. What and what everybody needs to know. The great thing about Texas, unlike the federal government, is we have a balanced budget amendment. So, whatever money you have is the only thing you can spend. And right now, we have done well over the last two years. So budget-wise, we came in. Budget-wise, both the Senate and the House and the governor have worked hard on. Budget-wise, we did well. What's well, interesting about that, it's a, I think, they, as I was reading, it's a 3% increase. But then the next top win is we had some tax relief yes, at the you same did. time. Almost $4 billion. What we were able to do is saying, OK, let's give money back. We don't always just have to take it from everybody. Let's give everybody some relief. And so one of the ideas was if we've collected it and we can give it back, let's give it back. So not only do you have a fiscally responsible budget, which you've heard from the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, you also have what I thought was fiscal responsibility of giving tax relief. I think what people need to understand that are listening, though, they may or may not see a decrease only because in our particular area, appraisal properties have gone up. Right. So it may be a wash. It may or may not be. Well, and that's not controlled necessarily. Your, your, the appraisals are local. Right. And every locality exactly. is different. 
And so it's hard for you and I to figure out what the appraisal up or down, because that's, that's basically a local control issue. But the idea that the state can at least say from the state, we got you a budget, we're going to give you some relief, now it be becomes local. I'm sure some local areas will get relief, and, and there will be some areas where they're just sky high right now in the real estate zone. But overall, the state did good. Uh, and the only reason I say because people are listening, sure. they go, oh, look, and then they go, what happened here? That's correct. And so like you say, it, the state took action, but then appraisal properties are dependent on the local appraisal. And it, and it is, and there are just some areas of the state that are having a huge economic real estate boom, and those properties values and assessments are based on those areas. All right, another topic, guns. Yes. All right, well, House Bill 90, okay, allows Texas to carry a gun openly. And basically, um, I think mo majority of the states do that now. But what are the stipulations in this law? There's two things that were passed. One was open carry, the other was campus carry. Okay. And if you notice, the governor was out front on open carry, I believe Wednesday, mm -hmm. right after the Tuesday election, he said open carry, he would sign the bill. What it basically says is right now, if you're a concealed handgun license, uh, you have to have a CHL, you have to have the CHL training, you have to go through all the checks. And then if you go through all that, then you have the right to conceal your weapon or open carry your weapon. What a lot of people don't know, there's kind of a glitch in the current law that if you are carrying a gun and you have your CHL license and it falls out of your purse, or if a man's coat uh, mm -hmm. comes open, you can be fined or you can be uh, placed under the criminal coat because that's an open carry, even though it might be accidental. Right. So the open carry also cures that. But what it really does is it's the current concealed handgun license laws. You have to go through all of that. You have to comply with that. And then you're able to make the decision on open versus concealed. Now, I don't think it goes into effect till January because the training and law enforcement needs X amount of months to prepare. But that's basically what it was. I was supportive of it. And uh, uh, as you indicated, a lot of people didn't know, but most of the states have open carry. Texas was just one of the few that didn't. All right, Senate Bill 11. That's the one that, like you mentioned, that's handguns on campuses. Correct. I know that's caused a lot of people to be a little concerned. So, But let's talk about that particular bill and what it does and what authority it gives the universities. The campus carry bill basically, again, you have to follow all the concealed handgun license laws. You must comply with everything that's in the state of Texas. I believe community colleges are given one or two years of a grace period before the law goes into effect. I think private universities are exempted because of the right. issue of private property. But on public campuses, each public campus, for example, uh, UT or A&M, they could make their own policy. In other words, you can't just do a blanket rule but you can say, uh, at this university system, we're going to allow campus carry, but only in these designated areas. Or you could be a university that says, we're not going to allow campus carry, but you could in these areas. So some discretion is given to the campuses, but the main thing is you have to follow the CHL, the Concealed Handgun Licensing Provisions. You have to go through the training, and uh, discretion is given with the universities. Well, thank you on that, because I know people have been wondering about that. Another issue, and I know it was uh, talked about at the last legislative session, and there was some relief, but now even more so. And I know people are going to welcome that, and that's transportation. Yes. Hey, let me tell you all, uh, 361, let's talk about it. That's the highway between Port Aransas and Padre Island. I've been looking at that highway for the last several years. Uh, it needs improvement. It's a safety concern to me. At the beginning of this session, I believe it was March, we got approval for $12 million improvement on that road. So what's going to happen by the end of this year, 
there is going to be an expansion of that roadway to three lanes, and you'll have turnoff lanes. Once the construction starts, then I will make some requests and have meetings to see if we can expand it to a four lane with lights. What I want to do is get the current contract started so we can start moving forward. It's unfortunate we had the incident, even though we've had the money approved, it just shows why we need to do everything we can to fix that road. And that's not the only road. Uh, you're going to start seeing some new projects all across South Texas. Uh, the current Texas Transportation Commission, uh, I consider very good. Uh, the people that they've been appointed are very good. Uh, one of the reasons is I know many of them throughout the years, and they're very, very open to learning about South Texas. So I look at a very positive transportation flow in the next few years. Well, the good thing is that it's moving forward. we got one minute left, but I don't want to leave this issue out. Sure. That's border security. Yes. So I know that's expanded $800 million worth. Uh, you know, what's it going to include? The border security is basically Texas taking control of safety and security. You're going to see a lot of money that's invested to allow Department of Public Safety folks to be able to monitor and help all through the border areas. And on top of that, I think you'll see some new technology that's used down there. And the main thing is let's keep everybody safe. Let's make sure that everything operates. But the great thing is, is when you're Texas and you have money, you can do things that other states cannot. But the main thing, it was a fairly strong bipartisan push to focus on security and safety and make sure that we had the right personnel down there and you're going to see a whole new group and I believe also the new law allows the guard to be used down there when we need it. So it's very positive. Oh, I also notice a great deal of professional development, yes. a lot of training. So that's yes. going to be great as well. And everybody should know we had South Texas support of that bill along with North Texas. So that's a big win when you can get those two areas. Well, well you and I could continue on, but we covered those five top issues and I thank you so very it's much. great to be here. Okay. Well, that gives us a little recap of the 84th legislature. Again, if you look at it and study it, you'll see that South Texas fared very well. And this has been Dr. Mary Jane Garza for Education Number One Priority. Mm -hmm.